I've got a good word for you. I'm telling you what I got a good word for you. It's been brewing in me for a couple of, couple of days now. And I didn't get the word on my own, I'll be honest with you. I got the word because I was studying. Because during my days and, and during my nights, when I've got some time on my hands, I keep my iPad close to me. I just open it up and I just start reading. I, I'm always reading three or four or five books. Because if I read one book for too long, I just get bored. And there's no point in reading a book if you're not getting anything out of it. Right. Like, I'm not, I don't ever want to waste my time. But there are good books that I get bored with. So I'll read one book for a couple of pages, a, a couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks. And then I'll put it down for a little bit, open another book. You know, open the Bible for a couple of pages. And if I'm not getting anything, I don't move on. I just go back and read it again. I might get something in the first verse. I might get something in the 15th verse. But, but I always go back and read it again. I'll tell you what, if you want to get something out of Scripture this week, let me encourage you, don't move on. Find a Scripture and spend time on it. Like, not like one minute. Like, find one Scripture and spend five minutes just memorizing it. And then spend the next five minutes and take out every word in the Scripture and say it again. And that's how you'll find out why that word's important. Because without that word, the meaning will change. Right. Put that word back in. And then for the next five minutes, just sit and wait on God contemplating that Scripture. I'll tell you what. I was reading a book the other day. The guy who wrote it, his name's Timothy Keller. He's a, he's a Presbyterian pastor in, in uh, New York. He said, if you'll do that, he said, you watch what happens. He said, more often than not, he said, you'll, you'll get the basic in the five minutes and you'll get a little bit more in the 10. He said, but the real revelation will come in the last five minutes. From 15 to 20 minutes when almost everyone else would have given up, God will speak to you in that moment more often than any other. Yeah. And isn't that just the way God works? He's an 11th hour God all the time. Yeah. That we wouldn't be relying on ourselves, but we'd be relying on him. Oh, come on. But you know, our whole church culture is shifting. We're moving in a different direction than we were in 2017. We're shifting to a culture of community, a culture of connection, a culture of, of me and you doing life together in meaningful relationship. One of, our, one of our core values at our church is cultivating meaningful relationships. We want you to be in relationships with people that aren't just standard, that aren't just passing high fives or water cooler conversations, but there are relationships that go deeper into the heart of who we are. You've heard us say over and over again over the past few weeks, we are created for connection. That's kind of our new slogan. We are created for connection. And Matthew 22, a Pharisee comes and asks Jesus, and we've talked about this before. He says, what's the most important thing I need to do? Like, if I'm going to do all that God has for me, what's the most important thing I need to do? And Jesus replies, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, everyone, everyone's on the page, but this is one of those things I spent 20 minutes on. This is one of those verses I waited for God on. And listen to this because I've told you this before, but it, it blew my mind again this week, and I want to bring it to you today. God says, because Jesus is God, God says, and the second is equally important. Like, listen to what he said. The first one was love God. I, think, I can't think of anything else. If you asked me as a pastor, just in a common sense kind of a way, if you said, what's the most important thing? I'd say, love God. And they said, what's the most, next most important? I'd say, it's way down the list. Like, you've got, you've got a big gap between the first thing and the second thing, and the first thing is love God. But that's not what God says. That's what Jeff thinks, right? And I don't ever want to teach you what I think. I want to teach you what God says, I think the most important thing is to love God and everything else, everything else is far down the track. But God says equally important, not slightly less important, but still very important, not, not a little more important, but just as important. Wow. So if you're not doing this second thing, then you're just as guilty as if you don't do the first thing. Wow. We want to love God and equally important is loving your neighbor as yourself. I've never lived next to anyone that I love that much. Never. In fact, when I was growing up, I lived next to a lady who was mentally handicapped. And she was paranoid schizophrenic, which means she didn't always act the same and she was always scared of us. And when I would pull my car out as a teenager out of our driveway, she would open the front door because she sat in her front window and watched the neighborhood all day long. It's all she did. She was about 45 years old back then. And she would come running out of her front door as soon as she saw me drive down the neighborhood and start chasing me down the street. I'm not joking. 
She would call me lots of names. She called me a cop killer one time. I don't know why she came up with that one, but she did. <laughs> I've never loved my neighbors very much. Since then, I don't really interact with my neighbors a whole lot. But God's ways are higher than my ways. God loves people despite who they seem to be. He welcomes them with all their flaws, with all their failures, and we have to endeavor to do the same. We're created for connection, and Jesus tells us right here we're created for that purpose. And the most important thing I want you to get out of this scripture and this idea that we're created for connection is that the first thing is love God, and the second thing is love people. How can we live our Christian lives alone? How can we live disconnected? If just important as loving God is loving our neighbor, how can we possibly live disconnected? We, we simply can't. We can't live the life, and our mission is to get you to experience full life in Jesus. We simply can't live the life that we're called to live unless we're connected. There is no biblical mandate, no biblical way, no pathway I can give you that says, this is God's will for your life that doesn't include you getting in community with people. It's just not possible. The world believes this. God created us this way. The world believes it. There's a guy named Henry Cloud. He's one of the top leadership psychologists in the world right now. You can look on Amazon and type in Henry Cloud books and you'll get hundreds. Not really hundreds, but it seems like pages after pages. Great books. You should pick one up and read it. It's fantastic ideas about who you are and how you can influence people. And he said this, Henry Cloud said, the undeniable reality is that how well you do in life and in business depends not only on what you do and how you do it, your skills and your competencies, but also who is doing it with you or to you. You don't have a choice about whether or not others have power in your life. They do. What you can control is who you give that power to, who you give that influence to. And in this church, the reason why we're shifting culture, the reason today why I'm going to talk to you about community groups, connect groups, the reason why I'm going to talk to you about that is because I want everyone in my influence to experience full life in Jesus. I want to invite everyone in my influence, and I want to influence you. And I hope, man, I hope you'll influence me. Because I want to find this full life, this life I was created to live today. I don't want to wait one more minute for all that God has for me. And if I read this scripture out of Matthew, what I have to understand immediately is that I can't do it without God and I can't do it without people. I'm going to take you through a couple more examples this morning of why that's true. But I need you to leave here today. The only thing I want you to know today is that in order to live the life God's called you to live, you have to live it in community. There simply is no other way. There is no other biblical pathway for living. Because not only are you created for connection, but God created you for connection. And it's important to understand that when we're created, that God created us. In John 17, right before Jesus is going to the cross... He prays to God for us. Jesus is about to wrap up his earthly ministry. He's with his disciples. He's about to go to the cross, and he prays. Look at what he prays. He prays this. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's me. Wow. That's you. All right? So he's praying for us, and he says, I pray they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, I want them to be one just as we are one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is no separation. It's the mystery of the Trinity. One God, three persons. And he's saying, Jesus, God talking to God, Jesus praying for us. Before he goes, he says, I'm praying for not only these disciples, but everyone who will ever believe their message. That's us. He says, I pray that they will be one just like we are one. This message about community has to go to the very core of who you are. If you want to be who God's called you to be. 
And just like my neighbor when I was growing up, I, I know she had issues. But it's not my job to identify her issues. It's my job to try to help her. It's my job to try to be Jesus as someone who can't even understand normal human relationships. It's my job to use all that God has given me to try to impact everyone that God has given me. Not just in a church sense that you might be members in this place, but in a community sense. If we really believe that God is who he says that he is, then I believe that ministry is so much more about our daily contacts than it is about our mission trips. I think God intends for you to impact people so much more often in your daily interactions than he does when you to go, okay, I'm going to set this week of the year apart to do something great for God. God's going, you just left Target and you missed the checkout girl. Like you don't have to go to India to, or, 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 or across the country to, to do a missions trip. All I got to do is send you out of the building and frankly, don't even have to leave here probably because you can minister to me because I don't have all that I need. God says to each one is given gifts for the helping of the other, for building each other up. You've got gifts that I don't have so that you can help me in my world. But I want to read this foundational scripture to you this morning, this Genesis scripture, literally. And man, it blew me away this morning, so I hope you'll pay attention with me and come with me, because I want to show you something that I've never seen before until I sat down and really read this scripture. You ready? Genesis 2 chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 24 says this. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave them he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord took out of one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, he exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she is taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. If you would, go back to that first scripture for me, that first set. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I think we all understand that one. It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who's just right for him. Listen. Listen to what I found in this little bit of scripture. God has created all of creation. Genesis, he did that in Genesis 1. Genesis 2 is kind of a recap. Genesis 1 is the might of God breathing everything into the world. Genesis 2 kind of talks about the, how things are going to work. He says, hey, you know, outside of Eden, there wasn't really anything growing because there was no rain. He just had springs coming up and there was land, but it was a garden that needed to be cultivated. So a man was going to cultivate and he kind of goes through some of the formalities. And one of the things that happens in Genesis 2 is that God says, it's not good that man is alone. But listen, in Genesis 2, no sin has occurred on the earth. Man has not yet sinned, which means the first man, Adam, is in perfect communion with God. Right. And yet we find in the scripture that he's not satisfied. Wow. Right. And I would tell you that's blasphemy <laughs> if I hadn't just read it. Wow. Very good. Very good. My understanding of how the world works is that we have this lack in our lives because we're separated from God. And if we would just get reconnected to God, then everything would be made right again. But that's not what the scripture says. That's what I think. What the scripture says is that even when there was no separation from God, even when we hadn't messed up the relationship, even before we got kicked out of the garden, even before we took a bite of that apple, there was a problem. Genesis 1, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. This is the first not good in the Bible. This is the first misdirection in the Bible. He says... I've created all, he, he brings all the animals. He's like, how about goats? How about, how about, how about chinchillas? I don't know, they're kind of cool. 
I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll create like a flamingo. It'll be pink, it'll be pretty, it'll stand up on these legs, it'll be cool. How about if I create an animal with backwards kneecaps and a giraffe and I bring him to you? Would that satisfy you, Adam? Like, what is it gonna take? German shepherds, fine, boom, German shepherds. Labrador retrievers, you wanna get licked to death? Here you go. He's like, I'm, I'm just still not satisfied with this thing. I would think God would have said at that point, Adam, if you're not satisfied with this perfect relationship with me, then, then I'm done with you. But God doesn't say that. He doesn't even blame man for being disappointed. This isn't the first sin that man's not in full enjoyment of his world without a community. It's simply a product of our creation. God created us. And in his creation, he found need to create a community of people around every man. Now, I know we see this scripture and we would say, yeah, yeah, but he's talking about marriage in this context. He is talking about marriage in this context, but he's talking about far more than just marriage. You know, you, you get pop culture Christianity and you'll hear people say, there's a God-shaped hole on the inside of each one of us that only God can fill. Well, maybe so, but it appears that there's a man-shaped hole as well. There's a person, there's a community-shaped hole that we just can't get around if we want to live the life God's calling us to live. Yet I hear people all the time say, well, my faith is kind of a personal thing. My, my spirituality is kind of a personal thing for me. I don't express it. Well, then I, I've just got to, you're, then your expression is wrong. Yeah. Then your expression is off. Because God's calling us in all these scriptures. God's calling us into community, not just with him. But with so many people, listen to this, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, man, one of my personal favorites, Jesus dies on the cross, is resurrected, appears to them multiple times, then goes away. It says, what are they going to do next? Acts chapter 2, 42, what are we going to do now? It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's awesome, and to fellowship. It doesn't say to the apostles' teaching and hiding in a corner and praying and believing, it doesn't say, and becoming holier than everyone else by fasting the entire, because they're about to eat in just a minute, Super Bowl Sunday, this Sunday. It says, yes, teaching is important, but it also says the first thing they did was teaching. The second thing they did was fellowship. Community. Because if Henry Cloud knows, if the world knows that we need people, that there's no self-made men in the world, then we need to understand and embrace not just say, yeah, yeah, we get that, Pastor Jeff. We understand. No, no, no. We understand. And now we're going to seek out people in our world who can help us become all that God's created us to be. John, 1 John 4, 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. Listen, this is crazy to me. This is like the, 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 the Genesis verse. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. They're saying, well, no one's seen God, but it's okay, because if you can't see God, if you'll just love one another the way I'm telling you to, you'll see God in those relationships. That's what this verse is saying. That's what the Apostle John, who walked with Jesus, who saw him crucified, who was called the disciple that Jesus loved, this is what he's telling us. He's saying, you, no one can see God, but if you'll just love each other the way I'm asking you to, in that place, you'll see the very heart of God. How many times have we prayed, God, just reveal yourself to me? And he's going, get in relationship, and I will. God, show me your heart for me. Well, if you just get involved in a connect group, in a group of people who can love you and you can love them through that relationship. Listen, I'm not making this up. It says right here, his love is brought to full expression in us. It means if Jesus appeared to you personally, there couldn't be more expression because this is the full expression of his love. Yet if we really believe that, Man, would we be craving relationships like nothing else in our lives? That if we believed that the way to get to a full expression of God in our lives was to get in healthy community with other people, that's almost unbelievable. James 5.16, another one that blows my mind. He says, confess your sins to each other. Well, good luck with that connect group. 
I'll confess my sins to God, but what? I don't need to confess my sins to everybody else. Like, I don't need to confess my sins to Andy. No, no. James, James, if you ever want to go like rubber meets the road, just go read James. He tells you just like it is. Confess your sins to each other. I don't need to do that. Well, funny, the Bible says that you do. Confess your sins to each other so that everything may be brought into the light. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. But I prayed, but you didn't confess to each other and allow people to pray for you. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Confess your sins to each other. Oh, I want to have lunch with Rob Anthony, but I don't really want to tell him about all the things that are going wrong in my life. Do we want the full expression of God or don't we? Man, no one says there's no biblical mandate for this thing is going to be easy. Meaningful relationship is a relationship that changes you from the inside out. And you can't get to meaningful relationship without authenticity. You know, there's no road that gets there without authenticity. You have to say, it's not just, hey, help me. It's help me. And before you say something, let me tell you who I am. That's when your life Listen, don't do that to everybody you know. Don't go to work tomorrow and be like, hey, cubicle, but mate, let me tell you about what happened to me this weekend. Very good, that's right. That's what it will feel like to them. No, no, you find some trustworthy people. Awesome. And you start opening up one thing at a time so you don't scare them away. Don't be like, here's all the stuff. No, no, one thing at a time. Join a connect group, get some relationship going first, build some trust, build some, and then say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with something right now. Could we talk about it? And then begin to reveal. I'll tell you, it's not about whether you want to or not. It's about how God created you. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let me ask you a question. If you're not in community, how do you bear somebody else's burdens? If you're not in community, how do you know what's going on with Corey to pull it on to yourself? How do you know what's going on with Keith or Josh or Andy to get that on your shoulders and so fulfill the law of Christ? Man, these are heavy, heavy things that can become full life in us once we engage. You know, John tells us in the very first chapter of his gospel, he says, the darkness has seen the light, but it hasn't understood it. All these dark places, all these confession places, all these deep emotional relationship places that we want to hold back in our life, we hold back and they stay in the darkness because we don't understand what the light's going to do for us. But if we'll step into relationship and release those dark places in our life into the light, then, then all things will be made new in your world then you'll experience this full life in Jesus that we've been talking about. It won't be a concept for you anymore. It'll be a reality in your world. Man, I've got so many more scriptures for you. Let me just move on to the end here. Because I can tell you all the, all the scriptures. I can tell you all the God things. I can, I can give you so many more to tell you about what God has for you and how that's all wrapped up in community. But that doesn't do any good for you if I don't then give you a pathway to take. I don't want to just leave you with a good idea. I want you to lead you to good life. I want to lead you to full life in Jesus. And the way you're going to get there is by establishing in your heart right now, getting that posture in your life right now while you're around everybody that you trust, while you're around this community that you've built relationships with, and you begin to get that posture of faith in your life and go, I don't know how this is going to work. I still feel like I don't want to be that vulnerable. I don't want to give up my time. I don't want to go to another thing. I don't know if I can invest in this. I don't know how this is going to work. I've never done this before. I've been to lots of community groups. I've never had relationships like that. I just don't know. And let all of that just come right through you right now. And then clear yourself out, clear your mind out. And then go, yeah, but God created me for connection. Yeah, but even in the very beginning, the Bible says it wasn't good for man to be alone. Yeah, but if I want the life God has for me, God says to bear one another's burdens. And so it's going to be a burden, but it's a burden I want to bear. 
But God says to confess your sins to one another. And right now, I'm not confessing my sins to anyone. And I honestly, I, don't, I look around, I don't see anybody that I'm comfortable with yet. So let me just go ahead and just, let me just try to establish a relationship where I might be able to do that so I might be able to find the life that God has for me. We want you to join a connect group. We want you to begin building these relationships in your lives so that your life might be changed through the ministry of this church. God will change your life, but he'll do it through other people. We want you to join a connect group. This Friday, we're releasing all the connect groups on our website. You'll watch social media. You'll see the release. You can go on. You can find kind of what kind of group you're looking for, and, and you can see a list of those groups and make contact and, and say, hey, when are you meeting? How's this working? Can I join your group? People start connect groups so that you come. No one's going to start a connect group going, man, they're going to put my name on the website, man. I don't, really know. I don't want anyone to call me and ask me if they can come. I mean, I'm throwing a party, but I don't want anyone to come. Everyone's invited, but please, no one say yes. No one's having a Super Bowl party tonight going, man, I just really hope I get to all, eat all these wings by myself. I don't want anyone coming to my house tonight. I invited people because I had to, but I hope they don't come. I know what that insecurity can look like in your world, but you've got to step over that voice in your head that tells you that people don't want you in your world wow. and step into the reality that God's calling you into community. This scripture in Hebrews 10 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us listen to this and let us listen, listen, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of the returning is drawing near. Oh, I don't need, I don't need another group. I don't need another, I don't need to connect. In Acts 2.42, it says every day they devoted themselves. Every day they gathered together. Every day they broke bread. Every day, I'm just asking for twice a week. Come to church, get a revelation, take that into small group, and then be a minister and get ministered to. Stand with someone who you can pray with during the week and stand with someone who can be praying for you during the week. That's where fulfillment is. I've got friends all over this church, but I need some meaningful relationships that'll change my life when my life isn't going the way God intended for it to go. This Friday, Find a connection. If you know someone who's starting a connect group, just go ahead and join. But if you don't, this Friday, look on the website, find a connection. They start next week. Listen, this is what our church is about because this is what our God is about. We want your life changed. It's not good that any man or woman should be alone. Where two or three are gathered, there I am also. Two's of marriage, but three, only in Utah. <laughs> God speaking beyond the marriage covenant right. in Genesis. You got to get people in your world. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And any shepherd, when he loses a sheep, when that sheep, he doesn't lose a sheep, like the sheep could be over there. He, he still knows the shepherd. He's just not in community anymore. It says the she what shepherd doesn't go after the sheep, pick them up, put them on his shoulders and bring them back to the 99. If you're out of community, let us help you put you on our shoulders and walk you back to the 99. Cause I'm telling you, we're not the same without you. We're not complete without you. God brought you here for a purpose and that purpose is to connect with us and to help us have an impact for Jesus in all the lives of the people in this place. Would you close your eyes with me and let's pray this morning.